Hello. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I figure we'll get us started so we have enough time uh, for the conversation and for questions after, and people can kind of trickle in as they, uh, as they want. Um, NSICA is a multifaceted whirlwind of a conference. Uh, this is my first year here. Um, I am overwhelmed and uh, overjoyed to be here. Um, we appreciate your time, interest, and participation in this particular conversation. Uh, my name is Rachel Messerich, uh, and I'm the Education Manager for the American Craft Council. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the ACC, uh, we're a national nonprofit organization um, headquartered here in Minneapolis, uh, dedicated to, to promoting, celebrating, and galvanizing diverse making communities and crafts impact on American life today. So before, um, before I introduce the folks sitting uh, to my right, um, I have the great pleasure of moderating this conversation around an event that has become one of the staples of our local creative community uh, in Minnesota, the St. Croix Valley Pottery Tour. Um, again, before I introduce the wonderful folks sitting next to me, uh, I wanted to provide a little context for those of you uh, coming in from out of town, um, as well, uh, as well as a, a few housekeeping um, details. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone to please silence your phones um, if you haven't done that already. Um, and uh, basically the format of this conversation, um, we're gonna have about a half an hour or so of moderated uh, dialogue, um, and then we do wanna open it up to, uh, to questions from you guys. Um, there's a microphone kind of right in the middle here um, we're encouraging people to use it uh, so that everybody can hear what you're asking. Um, and then NSICA is also uh, recording these sessions, so um, we definitely want to get everything down for them. Um, and then we also have this lovely slideshow uh, going on behind us. Um, these images were um, provided by uh, the potters here. Um, and it's just mostly a little bit of context. We won't be referring to it directly, um, but, um, but it's there for your viewing pleasure. Um, so to dive in, uh, over 25 years ago, uh, the St. Croix Valley Pottery Tour began with a small group of potters living in the St. Croix uh, River Valley, which is just northeast of the Twin Cities here. Um, they banded together in a coordinated open studio event which subsequently grew to incorporate the weekend-long tour that it is today. Consisting of seven host potters and studios and a national and international showing of guest potters, the tour, always held over Mother's Day weekend in May, uh, attracts thousands of visitors each year and has provided a model for similar tours that have cropped up all over the country. In 2014, the ACC received a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund uh, through the Minnesota Historical Society to compile and collect oral histories from nine of the then living potters from the St. Croix Valley. We presented this project at the 2015 NSICA conference in Providence, uh, and the material is available online through our ACC Library Digital Collection, uh, as well as the Minnesota Digital Library. I am so pleased to be a part of carrying this conversation forward. In 2015, we presented the history of the St. Croix Valley Pottery Tour, and today we focus on the future of that tour, where it's been and where it's going in this ever-evolving uh, creative landscape. Um, to that end, and without further ado, I, I wanted to take another quick minute to introduce my fellow conversationalists and four of the current hosts of the St. Croix Valley Pottery Tour. So I'll just kind of move down the line here. Um, first up, we have uh, Guillermo Cuellar, uh, who was uh, born in Venezuela. Guillermo turned to pottery after graduating from Cornell College in 1980. Uh, mentored by the late and great uh, Warren McKenzie, he established his teaching and studio practice and is a nationally and internationally recognized artist. Um, Ani, Kast Ani Kasten uh, is uh, a ceramist living and working in Schaefer. Uh, her career began with an apprenticeship under British ceramist Rupert Spira and continued through her own projects, including four years establishing a ceramic facility in Nepal and her work with the Gateway uh, Arts District and Mount Rainier. And then we'll have uh, Linda Christensen. 
another studio potter living and working in rural Minnesota. She studied at Hamlin University in St. Paul and at the Banff Center School of Fine Arts in Canada. Linda has an active exhibition record. Her work is included in numerous collections and she is a uh, profound educator traveling uh, throughout the country to um, share her passion for teaching. Last but definitely not least, we have Will Swanson, um, who's a studio potter living and working in Harris, Minnesota. Uh, Will graduated with a BA in social welfare and an MA in design. His love of functional pottery results in thousands of hours in the studio and countless interactions with pottery appreciators and collectors of his work. Thank you so much, you guys, for being here. So if you give me just a minute, I'm actually going to uh, take a seat and we'll begin uh, the moderated portion of this conversation. I'm just going to move the mic really quick, hopefully without dropping it. All right, you guys, are you ready to, ready to talk? <laughs> Um, so we, um, we had the privilege of getting together um, last fall to kind of talk through a little bit of this conversation and, and lay out beforehand. It was, it was lovely. Linda and her husband welcomed us, us into their home. We got to have um, delicious home-cooked food on handmade ceramic ware. I mean, it was like the dream. Um, <laughs> <laughs> At least for me. Um, and so, you know, we talked through a, a number of different topics and, and ways to kind of carry this conversation forward. Um, and I'd like to begin um, by uh, kind of clarifying the balance between uh, the collective aspect of the tour and the individual potters themselves and the individual hosts. It's one of the more uh, unique aspects to the tour. Um, the, the collective organization of the tour as a whole. Um, the host potters share responsibilities for promoting, for um, facilitating, for um, the financial management of the tour. Um, but each potter um, is, has sort of an autonomous uh, laboratory, I guess you could say, within their own studio. Um, they're able to uh, invite potters, um, their guest potters, um, and organize their, their setup however they kind of choose to. Um, and so I would, I would love to start out by um, talking a little bit about the inner workings of that idea, how it's evolved over the years, and how this community of guest potters has been built and maintained, um, and how it's going to uh, maybe evolve a little bit moving forward. And I wonder if Guillermo could start us out with that. Thank you, Rachel. Um, well, I was, a, uh, as, as you mentioned, I lived in Venezuela and I moved to the U.S. Uh, about 14 years ago. <clears throat> Some people have more sense, they move south when they get older. <laughs> um, and Linda was kind enough to take me in as a guest uh, artist at her uh, tour event. Uh, the, the tour had had six studios, and I hope you guys will break in and add a little context, too, because uh, there's so much history, and these guys are two of the founding members, so they have been at this for the last 26, going on 27 years. Uh, so one of the rules that the, that the tour had was that if anyone was going to be considered to be a host, they had to be a guest for three years so that people could get to know and see if that person might be a good fit for the tour. So I was a guest at Linda's for three years, and um, that was one of the most wonderful experiences, one of the most welcoming experiences for someone moving in from abroad and starting up in this ceramic community here. I didn't realize how rich this ceramic community was. It's, it's um, really quite breathtaking and, and uh, overwhelming. It seems like under every rock, there's another potter. So, <laughs> so yeah, so um, again, these guys have more history than I do, but the, the tour has a number of 
kind of some, some of them are written and some of them are unwritten rules and assumptions that the studios all work together on. Um, two of them are that we are allowed eight guests uh, maximum per studio, that it can only be clay. And what the third one that you just mentioned was? The potter has to be there. Potter has to be there. Yeah, that's, that's huge because we really want the contact between the potter and, and the guests, the people come to, that come to see pot, pots, because that, it's that really direct interaction with them that's really cr critical. Uh, there are other, are other assumptions and I think one of the ones that I think is, is really Im sort of really fundamental is that when these original um, hosts got together and started the, the, the tour, um, they recognized how, how important it was to have uh, people working together. In other words, that there was strength in, num in numbers. So all working together, they would have more chance of success than each individually going out and doing their own thing. Uh, and that was a point that I thought was really important. And uh, very often there is this, uh, I think it's a misconception that there is a sort of a zero sum game that if you have more people involved then each person is going to benefit less from the event. And I think the tour has actually been a really uh, one situation where that has not worked out that way. I think the fact that we've been more inclusive and brought more people in has actually contributed greatly to its success. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Guillermo. Uh, anybody else have anything to add to that about um, the community of guests and how that's evolved? Sure. Um, we didn't start out with eight guests. We started out with no guests. And about the third year, we decided to have one guest. And then we had three guests, and then five. <laughs> and then Bob Briscoe, who I'm not sure if he's here or not, but Bob and I were the ones who came up with this concept years ago. Bob went away somewhere, and he met all these people, and he wanted to invite more. Uh, so he came and kind of petitioned the group to have six or seven guests. And, and it, we've landed on eight. And eight. Eight is the number that seems to be able to uh, to work and we still can park all the cars and people don't, don't have to walk a half a mile. Um, it kind of fits the size of our spaces because we are inviting people into our studios. These are rural studios which are, which means people park on the road. Our neighbors sometimes complain. But, but we've grown to a size that's reasonable and we don't, we don't need to be any bigger. Um, because we have... <laughs> Yeah, financially, we, don't, we wouldn't mind doing better. Uh, we're doing okay, you know, but I um, uh, wanted to say something else about the size. Oh, well, well now we have eight guests and, and a host potter, so we have nine potters at each location, which means on seven locations, people don't always get to all the locations because you get caught up talking with seven or eight different potters at each place. Uh, so now it's evolved into the kind of thing where people say, well, this year I'm going to go there, and I'm going to go here, mm -hmm. and maybe I'll get a pot from this person from North Carolina that I would never see otherwise, but this is the one time they come to Minnesota, or from New York, or California, or wherever, because we invite, each host invites whomever they want. There's no group jurying or group process, uh, which has helped us maintain the, the character of each studio is a little bit different. Linda invites people that she meets in all her teaching travels. Um, I used to go to a lot of art fairs and I would meet people who were struggling to make a living making pots, making a living, and I would want to support them, so I would invite them to my studio. Uh, so we each have our own little perspective aesthetically and, I don't know, financially, uh, as to who we invite. Oh, anyway, I'll add that to that. Um. I would just say to on addressing the subject of the the balance of one's own studio practice uh, with the whole mad massive you know frenzy that is the tour. I think that um, the work that we do is very solitary and um, much like coming to an Ansika conference or something, when the tour happens, it's this incredible creative fuel for me um, because I'm just alone in the studio working kind of in 
a vacuum in a way. And so, um, and I think uh, as potters, especially making studio pottery, we're, the, the mission of our work in a way is to engage the community with um, handmade uh, human uh, spirit imbued objects for the home. And so um, the tour and all these people coming in and kind of getting together with fellow artists um, to celebrate uh, handmade um, pottery is kind of just like fulfills the mission that we all are working with in our studios alone throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, um, it's such a great element of the tour to be able to be welcomed into the homes of these great potters and, and not only experience um, their work and the guests' work, but also to experience, you know, their their home and your studio and kind of, I can only imagine how many questions you get about your kiln and your, you know, everything that's going on there. Um, and that sort of leads me into kind of this next question that really pertains to the site of the St. Croix River Valley as an important feature to the identity of the tour. Um, the sites and the tour stops are all at the homes and studios of these local potters. Um, as, and again, as someone who's seen the tour firsthand, I can say that being welcomed into the homes is one of the most sort of strangely, intimately magical mm -hmm. moments um, of, of the tour. Um, and so, you know, as the original hosts, um, you know, who have been doing this for almost 30 years, um, and even and even 10 years, um, as, as you start to sort of maybe think about transitioning away from the host duties, um, the importance of site specificity rises to the surface in new ways. Um, uh, Connie, Marin Cowles and Bob Briscoe um, have already sort of retired as hosts, not as potters. Um, and both Ani and Matthew Krause um, have actually taken over, at least in part, their studios um, and their host duties. Um, and so it kind of begs the question of, as these transitions are happening, how does that change or evolve within the landscape of the St. Croix Valley in and of itself? Um, and so I was hoping that um, we could maybe hear from Ani, who is a very new host to the tour, um, about her transition experience with Connie um, and kind of kick that off. And I'd love to hear again from, from some of the original hosts and, and folks who are doing it for, uh, longer about you know, your experiences, what you're thinking about collectively as a group and individually as, uh, as hosts um, as you're anticipating those transitions. Uh, well, I uh, stepped up as host um, very recently, just in 2016, and I had been a guest at Connie's stop for five years previous to that. And um, I think in my very short experience as a tour host, it, it seems like the group of host potters work so well together and that change and transition seem to just kind of happen very organically and in a very supported and consensus building way. And um, all of us honor and care about the legacy of the tour so deeply that um, we, but we know at the same time that, you know, things have to evolve or, or they die. Um, so uh, for Matt and I coming in, um, I appreciate so much the foundation and the legacy that Connie built at my stop for the last 30 years. And I, I've kept many things that she um, offered uh, as, you know, hand-me-downs in a way um, and uh, but I also feel uh, very supported and very free and like it's a fertile community to kind of it, make it my own you know in the coming years and and I have um, I feel excited that our our stop has become sort of enlivened. We've added um, three new artists in the last couple of years. And um, 
uh, I think that th that's just uh, the inevitable way that the tour is going to be sustained uh, heading into the future. Yeah. I'm, I might add that um, one, of the, one of the benefits of the landscape that we live in is that more and more potters want to move to our area and we're kind of finding ourselves kind of having a similar community that you'd find around uh, Penland, um, Aramont, um, Seagrove. It, it, it's like there's a, lot, there's a lot of potters coming to our area and really great potters. And how do we, I guess, look to the future and um, want to include great work? <laughs> How do we manage that? It, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it's an opportunity to find a way to sensitively um, grow in a way that re retains the, the initial qualities that we, we set out to, to have. And it, it, it's really an issue that's kind of at the forefront now that we're just starting to talk about. And we don't know how, how it will go. And, and in a way, that's where we are as artists. It's like if we know what we're doing, why do it? But it's sort of like we want to be we want to be excited and moving, and and try to find our way, and find a new way that we haven't thought of. <laughs> Great. Can we talk closer to the microphone? Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the feedback. Um, Anyone else, Guillermo or, or uh, Will, any other thoughts around that at all? Well, Linda, Linda said we're facing, we're always facing things evolving somewhat. Um, as a group, we, we tend to operate, on, we don't have very many meetings actually, we, but we function on the basis of consensus. There's seven or eight of us if you count, both Janelle, my wife, and I. We have two hosts at our site. Um, but if, basically, if, uh, six people agree that this is a good idea and two people aren't too sure, almost always the two people are willing to go along with it. You know? mm -hmm. And that's the way we've operated over the years as we've gone from three hosts to five hosts, from uh, uh, finally deciding it would be okay to have food trucks. Remember that? that mm -hmm. For a couple of years we didn't want to have food trucks. <laughs> now we do that. And things like that come up from year to year. I think one thing that is a, uh, maybe an obvious thing to state is that something that was very, very, um, I guess, fundamental to the whole operation is that every studio is committed to having the absolute best pots that they can, or best ceramic work, clay work, that they can uh, come up with by inviting the best people that they can, uh, that, that they can make contact with, you know. Uh, so, uh, that commitment kind of um, is a is a clear understanding between the studios. So, how you do that and what you consider are the important things are um, elements that respond to each potter's um, interests or or, or basic concerns. Uh, uh, but we all um, under we all. Uh, trust that everyone in the group is is absolutely committed to the success of the tour by making it the best possible event. Each each host potter invites their own guests. Uh, we have no group process. We don't take applications for for the tour. We, as Guillermo said, we there's a lot of trust involved. But you might get a little feedback from someone, or might someone might make a suggestion of someone they met who might be great if you had a slot at your place, you know. But we don't have a group process, we don't have a jury process. We like maintaining the individuality of the studios. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah. Um, and, even, and speaking a little bit further, you know, into the idea of like, kind of what you share collectively as a group um, responsibilities for, um, you know, part of that, um, as I mentioned earlier, is the financial, some of the financial management of the tour itself. Um, and I know that, that a couple of the very important um, kind of points of pride and, um, and aspects of the tour are that it's both completely self-sufficient, um, they don't take any sort of outside um, funding um, to, to run it, 
Um, and there is a definitely a clear philanthropic nature to it. You know, a portion of the money um, that they raise um, through the tour goes back to uh, either immediately locally the, um, the St. Croix Valley community um, or uh, more regionally to Minnesota communities. So um, I was wondering um, if you guys can reflect a little bit on where and how these two initiatives started and how they play a crucial part in the process, um, the success and the longevity of the tour as a whole. Um, I wonder if, Linda, would you mind kind of taking that one, kicking us off? Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think about maybe five years or so into the tour, we got this idea of uh, philanthropy and several of us had this idea that it would be good to find a way to, I guess, give, give back to our community that, that really allows us to live and work. And also thinking to the future and education and um, I guess there's a di couple different arms we've used. We've used the um, Potters, Potters for Peace uh, over the years, uh, SURF, the Craft Emergency Relief Fund, um, we've given to them. Um, we've given museums, university museums and collections, some clay centers, uh, money for them to purchase uh, pots for their permanent collections. Um, and then also uh, our local schools. There's two school districts we've been involved with. and. I guess one, the North Branch School, I think we bought maybe one electric kiln, and the Chisago Lake School District, we bought, I think, two electric kilns, a pug mill, uh, maybe 12, I think 12 pottery wheels. Um, one of our members is a community education teacher. A um, number of us have volunteered at the schools, go in and do demonstrations, um, and as school districts cut the money for the art department, um, those things become really important that the, the, our real future is really with children and the m biggest impact I guess a lot of us have felt is that by giving to our local uh, school districts time and money and equipment, um, it, it really hopefully makes, makes a difference uh, for, the, for the future. So we, <clears throat> I think we began by, um, I think it was about 5% of our income. Each, each potter that was part of the tour would write a check to our group, to our treasure, for 5% of their, their individual sales. And over the years, we've just turned that into a group expense, and we expense it out uh, equally to to everyone. So, I'm trying to think per it's, year what it's it is. Somewhat less than five percent now because our yeah. sales have been really successful. Um, we have a dollar amount of several thousand dollars that we we just charge our our guests a certain amount. We add it on to the to the bill, mm -hmm. and they they participate by uh, paying us about a hundred dollars more, uh, which we put into our fund for donations. And we, we really enjoy every year we have one or two meetings where we get together and say, I think we should give money to this. Right. And Linda always says, I should give money to this. Um, <laughs> so we have a nice discussion about where, yeah. we're, you know, is the money going to go locally? Is it going to go nationally? Uh, or we, like, uh, when the Mashiko <clears throat> kilns yeah, went down, right. we sent some money to Japan. And right. so it's always That's fun right. to think what we're going to do, and we feel yeah. good about it, of course. But, um, we, we've um, helped publish several catalogs. Um, through the Northern Clay Center, we've we've helped fund the Warren McKenzie. What's it called? The Warren. The, it's a residence scholarship. Scholarship. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really it's it really is fun to give money away. <laughs> 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 and of course, we each have you know eight guests at our studio, so yeah. we're, we're giving their money away too. But. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. But all for a good cause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All for a good cause. And it actually it's led me to do some other volunteer work um, in our St. Croix Valley. There's a foundation called the St. Croix Valley Foundation, and I'm on their grant review board, and we, we give money for uh, public events, concerts, and plays, and a lot of things with the schools all along the St. Croix Valley on both sides of the river. And it's got me really... 
um, in, involved in a way. I'm, I'm not able to give much money, <laughs> but I can give my time. And boy, it's, it's really so humbling and it's a wonderful feeling to be a, a part of that. It, it has absolutely nothing to do with trying to make a better cup for me, but it has everything to do with trying to trying to, I guess, connect to to the bigger bigger world and and the greater good. Mm-hmm. So, well said. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so, kind of to bring it back, I feel like as I've been thinking about this conversation and talking with you all, the idea of balance kind of comes back again and again. Um, as sort of a sub-theme, um, having to balance the collective with the individual, with, um, with your work versus sales, the tour versus um, sort of your creative space as artists. And so I was wondering if, um, if you guys could, could maybe reflect about um, how you maintain that balance yourself um, between you know, the quality and growth of the tour versus um, your individual makers, um, artistic vision, the need to sell, and then you know your creative—you know, protecting a little bit of your creative space versus the pressures of being a host on the tour, um, a little bit as well. Does anybody have any? Otherwise, I can call on people. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts, but I just—I just, just spoke. That's a lot. So. Yeah. Yeah. Someone else, I'll patch in later. <laughs> Guillermo, Ani, any thoughts? What was the question? <laughs> it was it was a big one. I'm sorry. I don't think. Um, I, I think I'll, just yeah, a quick yeah, comment. Yeah. I don't. I don't feel a lot of pressure. I feel pressure to be ready for the tour because even our guests. We, Guillermo said we have rules. You know, it has to be ceramics. You have to be there. The unwritten rule that's evolved is you have to bring all the pots you possibly can because we have such a great audience. They want to see 300, 400, 500 pots. They, we want them to feel like they're coming to your studio and seeing your whole body of work. And that's really worked well for us over the years. Uh, they, people come not just to buy the pots, but to meet the potters that have come from all around the country. Uh, so it's, we almost, I always, I, fast, I fantasize that we're creating this sense that they're coming to my studio, but it can be sort of like they're coming to my guest studio because they brought so many pots and we make them available. This, we have friends come and do the sales so, some, so they can meet the potter and talk about the pots. Um, the only pr- pressure I feel is to have enough pots for this event because we have such a great audience. And I suppose it probably affects a little bit the fact that, yeah, I better make more dinner plates, you know, to be ready for this. And maybe that squashes my creativity a little bit. Uh, but I, I, ne- I could get better at dealing with that, actually. No. Um, I would say that I, as the newest host of the tour, I also come from a little bit of a different background than the other hosts that have traditionally been a part of um, the St. Croix Pottery Tour. And I, um, I do make functional work, but I also make sculptural work. And I come from the East Coast. Uh, I never studied uh, with Warren McKenzie. <laughs> um, I didn't I, either. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I studied in England, and I would say that um, looking at my work, and some of you might be noticing from the slideshow that my work just has an overall very different look to it, um, which um, has been a struggle of balance for me mm-hmm. since I moved here because I feel tremendous responsibility for the tour to continue to be a success, but I also don't want to compromise my vision as an artist. So I've been feeling a little bit like I'm kind of breaking through the ice um, with these ideas that I have that are really kind of unfamiliar and strange to people. Um, So, and it can be a little bit defeating, you know, if if I feel like something I tried to communicate hasn't uh, taken with the audience and I'm trying to find and build my audience here and introduce something new. So um, that is, you know, a continuous uh, balancing act for me in my studio. Definitely, I can only imagine that there's some frustrations there with 
having to balance that creative vision with, with needing to sell work at the tour and have <coughs> folks having particular expectations of what they're going to see there. Mm -hmm. um, but Linda, you said you, were, you had some thoughts there too? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I, I find that the tour is kind of constantly on my mind. I wouldn't say every day, but um, I guess as it's grown, as we've added guests and we have more we, we have more and more meetings and it's just sort of a one more thing that's sort of spinning around it's like in our lives we've got our you know we've got our work when we're working and then we've got you know ex exhibitions that are coming up and visiting artists things different places maybe teaching somewhere and there's all these emails and text messages and phone calls and you know all these things we all have these things and the tour um, is one more of those things, but as it has grown and is such a wonderful thing, it's on my mind <laughs> so much of my time. And um, I guess one of the things that I struggle with personally when I'm in the studio, when I go in the studio, I don't want to think about anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't want a thought in my head. I want to I want to just be with the material and my ideas and feel like I am free to do whatever the heck I want to do. And and just as a mental health issue, I really have to work hard to make that work. And I'm just really aware of it. And perhaps I could organize myself better. <laughs> I have several character flaws and probably that's one of them is my my organizational skills aren't that great but um, I guess I I a bit like you're saying Ani it's like I, I really want to feel free in my <clears throat> in my head I guess I want to get my head right when I'm working and I don't want to make things to sell that that's never been my motivation um, Selling for me has always been sort of, oh, what I should do so I can make more. <laughs> That's sort of been my business plan. It's a little bit like playing store or something. I feel like I'm playing store. It's, it's not really. <laughs> anyway, it is, it is a real struggle for me. Um, and especially as the time gets closer, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of a gregarious recluse. And I'll, I'll credit that to Annie Dillard, the writer, and I thought, ah, oh, that's really what I am. And it's like, I really want to be by myself <laughs> in the studio working. And, you know, e sometimes even the thought of all these, all these people coming, all this stuff that's going to happen, it's like, oh, my God, it's, it's almost too much. <laughs> but it isn't. It's wonderful. You know, it's wonderful. Obviously, I've done it for 20 seven years and you know it's a joy it's a joy to have Ani <laughs> you know it is it's a joy and it's a joy to have everyone come it really is a joy to see you when you come I'm so happy to see you and I want to be with you and it is a wonderful thing but it does have it does have a toll it does take a toll and Mm -hmm. People don't really talk about it that much, but maybe other people are more mentally together than I am. <laughs> but I just want to ski today. You know? <laughs> I want to be home skiing. <laughs> no, I want to be here with you, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Real talk. I, Is that I, okay? I just, I just want to, okay? I just want to say the same thing Linda said, but in a different way. <laughs> um, imagine, okay. imagine oh. you're you're a, an, an actor and a director and the owner of a theater. Yeah. I'm just looking at this audience, and it just kind of makes me think about a theater. And so you're the actor, you're the director, and you're the manager. Yeah. And that's kind of what we are. You know, we wear all of these hats. But at the same time, it's just this huge privilege mm -hmm. to have a theater. And yeah. to have, and to have, to be able to do this, you know, and, and to have all of you people and everyone that comes to the tour, mm -hmm. to look at and take away the stuff that we make and take them home, and that to me is the reason for being. That's what I do, you know. That's 
So there, yes, it's true. There are times when it gets in the way of a lot of stuff, and a lot of times we want to, you know, go out and play, and actually we got to do something th that day. Um, but I think if you ask any entrepreneur on any individual uh, business owner, any self-employed person, th that's basically the, what it is. It's, you know, you, you just have to get some things done and there's always more to do than, than you can get done. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree, you have to learn to carve out the time and to block out the time to be able to be in the studio. We were just commenting earlier that there is a, a potter, you all know Michael Cardew, and I, I remember reading something, this may not be an accurate quote, but he said something like, a potter spends 20% of his time making pots or throwing pots. And he did say his, which Linda objected to, and I agree. Well, it wasn't uh, objecting, <laughs> I was just pointing it out. Pointing it out, <laughs> yes, that was a good point. Um, but you know, that was before social media and the internet and cell phones and text messages and you know, doing your own photography and doing your own um, shipping and you know, everything. It's like it's a miracle that we actually get any pots made. Uh, but that's, you know, uh, that's the way. It's a reality. It, it, it's like, what was that fire sign thi thing? Uh, fire sign theater quote was, uh, it's a little like living with bees in your head. Yeah. But there they are. <laughs> that's right. I think that's tinnitus, too. <laughs> it do, I'll say one quick thing, and that's, uh, it does get to be, like Linda said, you think about it almost every day of the year, and especially six months ahead, you start Me planning, too. and oh, way ahead. And then, well, then we were actually busy. We were making the poster and setting up the website and doing all the stuff. Um, but I, in my head, I always go back to the idea that when Bob Briscoe and I talked about this years ago, <clears throat> the whole idea is to get a handmade pot in somebody's hand, get them to take it home and use it, and they'll bring their friends, they'll bring their family. Uh, they'll, learn, they'll teach themselves how much they like handmade pots. The only way the only way we're going to be successful and have more potters be successful is to get more and more people to use pots. The only way to do that is to get them to try it. And this thing that we've come up with, this inviting them to our to our studios, is great. You don't have to go to an art fair; uh, they come to you. You know, it's it's marvelous. Uh, but as it's gotten bigger and bigger, it does take a lot of preparation. Um, but it's working. Uh, People come and they talk talk about the pots they bought 20 years ago and the pots <laughs> pots they gave to their children and yeah. uh, for me the dinnerware set you made for our daughter when she got married or something you know mm -hmm. um, the connectedness is what it's about yeah yeah and the and the the people the people we meet um, is remarkable the connections we make with people the stories the stories I've heard from people it's just so beautiful. One last thing, too, is that we have such a buy-in and support from our guests, the people that we invite at each mm -hmm. one of our studios. They're willing to provide us with their own personal mailing lists so that we can compile a huge list that we send out to send our, our mm -hmm. flyers out to uh, all, of our, all, all of that com combined mailing list. Mm -hmm. You know, they trust that we're going to use that mailing list for the benefit of that one event and then delete it, which is what we do. And, and it just is, is, is just a wonderful feeling to have that you know, support from that huge community of potters that comes and works together. So I guess I'm just repeating that message that there's, there's strength in numbers, there's strength in working together towards this common goal and just recognizing that the goal is worth it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, you guys. One of the, one of the Oh sure. Oh, I was I was just gonna I was just gonna say that I I do have like one or more burning question, but we are getting a little bit late in our time, so I do want to open it up to uh, to questions. Um, I wonder if we would mind uh, using the microphone. I'm so <laughs> sorry, Janet. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate it. You could, it. <laughs> you could pass it around, Janet. Too. You oh. could pass the microphone around. Yeah, I could do something. Yeah. <laughs> 
Is it working? It, it, is, it should okay. be on. Uh, two questions. One is I would like to know if there was any strain with your transitions with the sale, like when Bob Brusco is going to sell his place, did the rest of you have to approve the person who was taking over? And the second question is, <laughs> surely you have weather stories that you can share with us. Weather? Oh, oh, oh yeah. weather. Got some yes. great yeah. weather stories. <laughs> our, our transition has been amazing. We've, uh, Connie found Ani, or actually. Bob found me. Bob and I met you too, and you know, Ani, Connie was looking for someone to invite, and Ani's name came up. Uh, and Bob, when he had his place for sale, he wasn't sure he was gonna find a potter because he has a studio set up in the kilns and he was hoping to find a potter. And he really lucked out too. He fat found mm -hmm. Matt Krause who was working at the Northern Clay Center and had just graduated and was able to somehow swing buying this nice studio. Uh, we really lucked out. We found these uh, mature, responsible people to join our group. <laughs> but Bob, uh, Bob uh, did ask our did. group for, for permission. He wanted to know if we thought we would probably sort of kind of approve this person as a, as a host. And we said, yeah, it looks like we will. You know. so, and that's worked out. Well, we, we, we always work towards consensus. And, and we, by consensus, he said yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We did. We did. What was the second uh, part of the weather, weather stories? The weather. Oh, we had a, a, a big wind come through um, the night before the, the sale. I think when we just had it on the weekends, and I was still unloading the kiln, and I heard something, and I, I was bringing stuff out of the kiln, and I looked, and I watched, I think, 14 big maple trees, one after another, just bam, bam, wow. bam, down. And it just missed Tim Crane's uh, pods. Yeah. It was incredible. I think that was the year we spent uh, most of the weekend without electricity at our studio, which meant the bathroom right. didn't, you know, the water pump wasn't working, the bathroom didn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't the kind of crowds we have today. That was quite a few years ago. But our neighbor brought yeah, up five gallon jugs of water. And, oh. uh, we had a tree across we've had our some driveway. I guess. Uh, but mostly it's Mother's Day weekend, which is like the second weekend of May, uh -huh. and the tr leaves are coming out on the trees, and it's green. After the long Minnesota winter, everything is green. We assume people in the city are anxious to get out and drive around in the oh, country. Oh, we, we had mosquitoes one year. Oh. Pe <laughs> people would get out of the car at my place, and they'd get out of the car and, and go like that, and then they'd get back in the car they and leave. They got back in the car and drove <laughs> away. Yeah. Yeah. And we, somebody brought this... Uh, uh, Mary Beringer's partner brought brought this bug spray called No Stinkin' Bugs, and that was the only thing that would work. It was horrible. But for the most, I mean, 95 percent of the time, we've had reasonable weather. Had we had a few when years ago, we had snow on Friday and at our place. Yeah. yeah, we have a dedicated audience. <laughs> yeah, I, I always remember the first few years that I was here, and I don't know uh, whether you know you can attribute this uh, short term thing to global warming or anything, but you know, it used to be a lot colder. I remember being at Linda's as a guest, and it was always raining and wet, and everybody was in a parka. Uh -huh. But Minnesotans are hardy folk, you know? They get <laughs> out of their car with, with their parka, and they grab their, you know, coffee and go around and take their pots and then go back and warm up in the car. There's a little bit of the, this is once a year. People anticipate this. You know, we send these posters out in January to people all over the United States so they can plan, because they've asked us, they want to they want to buy airline tickets if they're gonna come from Maine or California, which they do. Uh, so we send those out early, and people in Minnesota come, it's a once a, once a year opportunity to see these potters from all over the United States. It's, it's, they see it as a national event now, it's not just, not just your local potters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sir. I don't mean to be rude in it. Uh, <laughs> oh, do go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just wondering how you see um, things evolving in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's well, a big question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's our own personal work, which it all depends on our own personal work evolving. Um, and then I think the the other question would be more with a with a community and other potters, other terrific potters moving to the area and 
again, how to be inclusive and how to, how do we manage that in a you know in a great opportunity kind of way? Um, those are the two things I think of. I think I, I see kind of a, an organic evolution going on, and and you know opportunities arise that you really can't predict or imagine. Yeah. Um, in in my life, something that was just absolutely uh, blew me away is that my daughter showed up and decided yeah. she was going to be a potter. Yeah. That's so, so that incredible. opens a whole world of possibilities yeah. and problems. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, Well, hold hold on, sir. We we should um, get your. He can talk loud. I can hear. Are you okay? She's just going to bring you the mic. I think it's mostly for the recording. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> and thank you. That's Bob Briscoe, by the way. This is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Would would you talk about the national scope of the event? when it dawned on you to think about it nationally and how you went about activating that and what have been the consequences? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember how many things well, uh, I Well, I guess just the initial idea of inviting guests who did, were not local, guests that, that uh, did not live here, and also guests that live in other countries um, Jeff Astrike for, I think Jeff was the one to bring some international guests. Ge Jeff had people from New Zealand, Wales, mm -hmm. England come before the tour and actually work in the studio with him. Um, I had a friend from Norway come not long ago and work for a month before the tour. And I guess that idea of working, you know, working together with someone with a common goal was, was really incredible. I mean, it, it brings some issues, of course, you know, where are they going to stay and how are you going to pay for it and work permits and all that. But um, I, I, I think it's those, those sort of two things and the people who, uh, you know, bring their mailing lists. So we, we, we bring along a lot of, a lot of the People who don't live here, um, their their customers are curious about this. What this is, what this is, um, and then I guess there's social media and you know the v invention of the internet, <laughs> and connecting that way uh, has really opened up, opened that up. But it's a conscious choice to 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 do that, and I can't think of an exact moment where that happened. Maybe you can, but. I think Bob, Bob had a lot to do with that. Bob traveled a lot and met a lot of potters. Um, he wanted, he, I, we all wanted it to be the highest quality show we could get. So we wanted to bring in some potters who were making terrific pots from other parts of the country that our customers had never seen. We want to keep that going when we talk about the future. We're all about what we see as quality. I mean, not everybody would agree with us, but we each have our own idea of bringing the highest quality potters for our customers so that they can see something different and they'll keep coming back. Uh, Bob invited somebody from Scotland years ago, remember that? Um, and then Jeff, Jeff really pushed that where he had people mm -hmm. come and work from New Zealand and Australia mm -hmm. and, and you've done that. Um, but I think that the idea of having this show have a separate identity from any other art fair that's going around here in the Midwest, this is an invitational which means you can invite the best potters from New England, you know, or the best potters from California that you see as the best potter. And it's your responsibility to do that. Uh, and Bob really pushed that because he was really well connected to lots of people. He did, did art fairs all over the United States, uh, supplied us with continued energy, new ideas. I'm sorry he isn't on the panel. I, I also just quickly wanted to point out that from the other side of it, you know, Bob used to keep track of where people came from in the audience, in our clientele. Yeah. And I, at one time, also did, and I wish I could remember the exact figures, but that was 
uh, maybe five or six years ago, um, I remember we counted up the number of states that people yeah. came to our studio from and countries. So it was, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe 27 states and you know half right. a dozen countries mm -hmm. were represented in the people that traveled you know, a significant distance to come to the tour. So in that sense, and maybe Bob would like to say something about, you're, you had a map with pins. So you may have more exact figures. Yeah, we, we put up a map of the United States and we let people put a pin in where they would come from. Right. And it was like 28 states and five yeah. countries. Mm -hmm. But we did a, a zip code study a few years ago. We, well, we keep doing it. But um, we found that 23% of the audience, which is about 6,000, came more than 300 miles. Hmm. So it's, yeah. Well, I mean, that was my data, but, but yeah. I, think, I assume you could average it out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to thank uh, the American Crafts Council and Rachel for really being our, our champions in a way. Yeah, this was yeah. at their initiative. Yeah. You know, yes. They came to us and said, we want to, we want to uh, what, point out the, the St. Croix Valley Pottery Tour and all that you've done. So we really appreciate it. Yeah. All right, one, what, maybe one more question and then we have to wrap it up, but please. Well, it may be a quick question, I don't know. Um, I'm astonished at the vitality that you have retained and allowed to flourish over the 26, 27 years. I'm curious, um, you said at the beginning it had to be self-sufficient and that you didn't receive funding. Mm -hmm. and obviously that was a conscious choice and I'm wondering why. Oh, I, I think I could speak to that. Um, we didn't want to be beholden to any organization or government or group. We wanted to be autonomous and make our decisions ourselves through consensus. And it seemed like that, that's a kind of a principle that um, if applied, it would prevent problems that we weren't aware of. <laughs> we didn't want those anything like that to pop up. And we, we could tap into the Minnesota, you know, the arts, the legacy funding. We could have done that. We could also have um, gotten advertisers for our poster. And I remember being very adamant myself about the poster originally. I, I didn't want to have a lot of clutter on it with advertising shops and motels and things like that. So we do include that on our website as kind of a public service to help our guests find out where they can stay. But we, we really wanted to be free visually <laughs> and in our heads. We wanted to be free from being beholden to anyone other than ourselves. I have one thing to add about that. As a new host, I have been just amazed and inspired at the level of personal investment that all of the hosts put towards the tour by not taking any outside funding or outside investors. It's really um, personal investment of time, mm -hmm. of finances, of um, our properties um, and opening, you know, everything that we have to the public and um, that comes from inside all of us, I think, mm -hmm. and I'm really impressed with my colleagues, that aspect of uh, personal investment. I well, have, a, I have a, a, a niggling feeling when I get all these brochures in the mail that say uh, this, this little art fair is, is sponsored by all these people and funds from the state of Minnesota that the, the arts sometimes is looked at as a charity. It's like the only way the arts are gonna work is if everybody donates money or we give them tax money or something. We wanna show that we're a viable business. We wanna be respected in our communities as not only an not only exciting arts component of what's going on, but we're, we donate money back to the community. We're successful. We, we don't wanna feel like we're, we need uh, sponsors to help us get 
by from day to day. Anyway, that's just my own personal thing. Um, thank you again for everybody for, thanks to you guys.